guys welcome back to my channel it's Lainey and in today's video I will be talking about the serial killer on Blood Mountain so this case was super interesting to me because it's super close to home I live in Georgia and as a matter of fact this serial killer actually passed through my town so that was just something that really drew my attention into this case this will be a grim get ready with me video so I will be doing my makeup so I hope you guys really enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think below. Meredith Hope Emerson was a 24-year-old girl who was born on June 20th in 1983. Although she was born in Charleston, South Carolina, she moved around a lot. She then went to the University of Georgia and graduated in 2005 with a bachelor's degree in French. Now, Meredith had actually done so well when learning French that she was awarded the Cecil Wilcox Award for Excellence in French. Now, Meredith did martial arts for a few years and she loved, loved, loved being outside. Um, she loved hiking, you know, kayaking, stuff like that, and everything you can do outside. Um, and at one point, she ended up rescuing a dog from a rescue kennel, and she named her Ella. This was perfect for Meredith, as she loved hiking, loved being outside, so it was really, it was just a good match, because she had a dog who she could go hiking with, essentially. Now, on New Year's Day in 2008, Meredith had gone hiking with Ella on Blood Mountain in Georgia. Now this trail in specific was a little bit different from what Meredith usually hiked. Um, Blood Mountain was about 40 miles away from where she actually lived. Now Meredith had left her roommates a note that said, took Ella gone hiking. Um, there was no other details, not saying where she went hiking, you know, what time she'd be back, any, any of that. Now her roommate Julie just went about her day. Um, she had gotten home later that night, and it wasn't really weird for her to notice that Meredith wasn't there. She just assumed that she had been out hiking a bit late, but it was only until she woke up that she started to get a little bit suspicious. Now, this particular morning was one that Meredith was supposed to be working. She had a job in sales at the time. So every single morning, Meredith would bring Ella into her roommate Julia's room, you know, just so then that way she was in there whenever she woke up and Julia could watch her throughout the day. Now this particular morning, Ella was not in Julia's room, so her first thought was that Meredith had slept in late and was missing work, so she went upstairs to wake her up and Meredith was not in there. So Julia tried calling Meredith a few times and she didn't answer, so Julia just assumed that she had left early for work that morning and left Ella with someone else to watch. So then a few hours later, Julia received a call from Meredith's work asking where she was because she had not showed up for work that day. At this point, after receiving the call from Meredith's work, Julia decided to make a missing persons report. So Julia had gathered a few of their friends and luckily Meredith kept a little book in her room that was full of different hiking trails in Georgia. She had circled and highlighted the ones that she wanted to go on. So her and her friends loaded up and went to all of these different trails. They had split up into groups and so then that way they could cover more area faster. They had contacted park rangers and maintenance and asked if they had seen anything, but all of them said no. Now at this time, one of Julia's friends had called her and told her that she had found Meredith's car. One weird thing about her car was that it had been covered in snow, so that pretty much told them that Meredith hadn't been back to her car in a while. So then all of the, her friends met up at Blum Mountain and each went on different trails trying to find Meredith, but all of them pretty much said that they had this just really bad feeling in their stomachs. They knew that something bad had probably happened to Meredith. After searching for a few hours, no one had seen Meredith or her dog Ella, and it was starting to 
become nighttime and on Blood Mountain the temperatures drop significantly so it can be extremely cold and um, it was in the middle of winter. So they didn't want to leave Meredith there overnight because they knew that if she was injured her or lost or anything of that sort they knew that she could not stay on blood mountain overnight because she more than likely would have died from the harsh weather so they continued searching and they couldn't find anything until they stumbled upon what appeared to be some of meredith's belongings this included a few water bottles a dog leash and dog treats now one of the most alarming things that they found on the scene was a police baton which is like those little like bat looking things that police use to defend themselves well you get the point it's, it's just like a bat basically that cops carry around all the time so they pretty much knew that the likelihood of this baton being meredith's was pretty low and they assumed that someone had came up to her and attacked her which led to her dropping all of her things as well as just ruffling up the leaves floors not the floor the leaves there were um like sticks broken around it just looked like something had happened in that area the ground was disturbed the police had pretty much decided at this point that they needed to kick up the investigation they ended up having a little like police base for you know anyone to come up to if they had any information and you know just searchers to come there cool down you know what i mean it was just like a little police base now a few of the regulars who hiked on blood mountain a lot came up to this little police base and claimed that they had seen a young woman with a black dog which was more than likely meredith because ella was a black dog um but they had seen her talking to an older man these witnesses described this man as being in his 50s or 60s and he was bald and then he they said that he looked strange um I don't know how to describe strange necessarily, but I feel like I understand what they meant. Now, one of the witnesses gave a pretty big lead, which said that he believed that he had seen the older man getting out of a white van earlier that morning. So then police started asking these people if they had seen a white van come there that morning or if a white van you know someone driving a white van frequented the area one man in particular did come forward and say that he did see this man show up in the morning with a white van and he actually had video proof so at this point police had their first suspect so they began telling people to keep an eye out for an older man who was bald driving a white van who also had like a, a reddish tinted haired dog they even set up a specific tip line for people who had, you know, tips regarding this to call and give their information. So police actually use media to their advantage, which is something they don't do very often. They did this because they knew that chances most likely were that if Meredith was still alive, she was in extreme danger. Police had the idea that, you know, if they made all of these um, huge announcements on, you know, news channels, media in general, and whoever abducted Meredith saw them, then they would see that, you know, they were close to catching him. They had a sketch of what he looked like. They, they knew who they were looking for, just not exactly that whoever did take Meredith would eventually either mess up, leave some sort of evidence behind, or just, you know, let her go, or eventually lead themselves towards him. Now, all of this media exposure led this man to call police and say that he believed he knew who they were looking for. He said that the police description of the suspect matched a former employee of his, so not only did this man say that this former co-worker of his matched police description, he also knew that his former co-worker did frequent Blood Mountain a lot. And to top it off, the man even claimed that his co-worker carried a police baton with him at all times. 
Now, the man that this tipper had identified was 61-year-old Gary Hilton. So police went into the system and searched up his name. They ended up finding his driver's license, printing out a picture, and bringing it to Blood Mountain to show these people who frequented the area a lot, and every single one of them said, yes, that is exactly the person that I saw that morning. So police took this information and gave it to the media, and within days, Gary Hilton's face had been all over every single news outlet. So this led to someone in Florida calling Georgia police to claim that they believed that Gary had something to do with another murder, but in Florida. 46-year-old Cheryl Dunlap from Florida had went missing. Her disappearance occurred just a month before Meredith's. So when Cheryl hadn't attended church one morning, her friends and family knew that something was immediately wrong. She never missed a day of church. She was very faithful and enjoyed it. She went every single Sunday. So on top of her just enjoying church in general, she even taught a Sunday class after the church service every Sunday. So all of her friends grew more suspicious by the minute, so they ended up going by her house and finding that her car wasn't in the driveway. So they went inside and found that her dog was inside, which led them to believe that Cheryl had left that morning to attend church, which is typically what she did is she would leave, you know, with the car, but she would leave her dog inside. So it sort of just made sense that Cheryl had left willingly on her own. So all of Cheryl's friends had gotten in contact with her family and they reported her missing. It wasn't very long until police ended up getting their first lead. Now, Cheryl's car had been parked on the side of the highway and, you know, a car parked on the side of the highway is already a bit odd enough, but her car wasn't necessarily parked. It was almost like it had been run off the side of the road. So when police had sent this car in for investigation, they did find that the tire had been popped, which made sense because that would explain why she was, you know, off the side of the road into a ditch, but they found that her car tire had been intentionally popped. It wasn't something where it just blew out on its own. It was punctured. Her car had been found right next to a 58,000 acre area of wood, so police knew that it was going to be extremely difficult to search the whole area. Cheryl's friends and family, as well as thousands of people from the community, came out to search the first few bits of the woods on foot, and it was quite miraculous that that many people came together to search for Cheryl, but inevitably, it was nearly impossible for them to be able to search the whole area, so in the end, cops ended up calling off the investigation. So then police decided to look into Cheryl's personal life. They wanted to see if she had any enemies, anyone who would want her dead. They just couldn't find anyone who would want to hurt Cheryl. So four days after Cheryl went missing, the investigation was in full swing. People were searching for her and police decided to pull up her bank statements and see if, you know, her credit cards had been used since she had gone missing. And as a matter of fact, they were. They were used three times at one particular ATM. So they decided to look up and see who had been using Cheryl's card and they ended up finding that it was a man and this man had intentionally covered up his face. So two weeks after Cheryl had gone missing, two hunters were in the woods around the area that Cheryl's car had been found when they spotted a vulture. So these hunters decided to go check out the area, see what the vulture was looking for, and they ended up finding the dead body of a woman in the woods. Now, the reason why I say a woman is because they had no idea who this was. Of course, they probably suspected it being Cheryl, but the woman, her head was missing as well as her hands. So after taking DNA samples, police did find out that it was in fact Cheryl. So now we're gonna go back to the story of Meredith. So Meredith has been missing for a few days and a tipper has just claimed that it is Gary Hilton, so they're out on the hunt for Gary Hilton and someone from Florida has just called to claim that they believe that Gary 
is also responsible for a murder there. So not only was Gary being suspected of at least kidnapping at this point, Meredith, as well as murdering Cheryl Dunlap, he was also suspected of murdering two more people in North Carolina. So John and Maureen Bryant were both found murdered. Their bodies were found also in a plot of woods just two months before Cheryl had went missing. So the Bryants loved nature. They were always hiking, going on camping trips. They just loved being outside, quite similar to Meredith. No one had actually noticed that this couple had gone missing. They were an older couple. They All of their kids were grown up and moved out of the house. They moved from New York to North Carolina. So I'm sure they had friends, but at the same time, they, they kept to themselves. They didn't, they didn't have someone that they were constantly having to check in with, you know what I mean? Eventually, two weeks later, their oldest son grew extremely suspicious of why they had disappeared, so he decided to go by their house after they hadn't answered his or his siblings' phone calls for two weeks. So the first thing that he did notice was that newspapers had been piled up on the front doorstep, which basically told him that they hadn't been home for at least that two-week period that they were answering phone calls. So Irene's body had been found, but there was no sign of John anywhere. So they decided to check and see if their card had been used. And as a matter of fact, it had been by a man in Tennessee matching something similar to the man that was seen using Cheryl's card in Florida. So police continued to search and they could not find John's body anywhere. They used the media, they reported his him missing on the news, they even offered a $10,000 award and they got absolutely nothing. So at this point, police decided to speak to Gary Hilton's old boss and just try and get a grasp of who Gary was. So this boss had told them that Gary kept to himself. He didn't have very many friends, he didn't socialize a lot while at work, and overall he was a bit of a loner. So Gary's boss had mentioned how Gary had told him quite frequently how he was constantly getting into arguments with people on this trail in Blood Mountain about how they were treating their dogs. For instance, if Gary believed that this dog owner was doing something that could potentially put the dog at risk or just in general something that he didn't like very much, he would get into altercations with these people. So after Gary failed to show up for work for a few days, his boss ended up showing up to his house and finding that the home was just a complete wreck as well as Gary himself. So eventually this boss ended up firing Gary. So quite ironically, Gary's former boss actually received a call from Gary. <coughs> I have the hiccups. So Gary had asked his former boss, he said that essentially the reason why he had been slacking off a bit was because of the fact that he just wasn't feeling very well. He was having a really bad mental health episode at the time and essentially that he was ready to come back. So Gary's boss thought very quickly at this point. He said he knew that he needed to lead Gary to police. So Gary's boss told him that he could go stay in one of his houses. He would leave him an eight, he would leave him an eight hundred dollar check, and that he could, you know, just stay there until he got back up on his feet. But really, Gary's boss, his plan was to have a full SWAT team there and then be able to catch Gary. So the SWAT team what? So the SWAT team had been out there for days and Gary never showed up. So police meanwhile were um, still checking in on Meredith's bank statements trying to see if any money had been pulled from her account and as a matter of fact someone was using her card. It had been used at multiple different ATMs but it didn't work. Every single it was basically for instance Gary we pretty much know it's Gary we pretty much know it's Gary at this point. He had been going to different ATMs, but for some reason it wasn't allowing him. 
it wasn't allowing him to get money out. So Gary Hilton led police to Dawson Forest in Atlanta, Georgia and told them that her body would be there, but he did warn them that she would not have a head. So essentially police were looking for a headless body and eventually they did end up finding Meredith's body. So while these police were out looking for Meredith's body, um, other police officers at the station had Gary and they just wanted him to tell them the full story. He had nothing to hide at this point. He had already pleaded guilty. He did say that it was not easy whatsoever to capture Meredith because, you know, she had been in martial arts. He said that she really did put up a fight. So he claimed that Meredith had managed to disarm him twice, once being the baton that they found at the scene and another being a bayonet knife. So he dropped the bayonet knife and he managed to pick that one up, but when it came to the baton, he knew that he had this tied up woman, he couldn't just leave her, so he left the baton at the scene. So once he finally did capture Meredith, he brought her back to his van and he told her that if she said a word, he would shoot her. Now, I don't think he had a gun. I think that was just sort of like a, a threat. Um, but nonetheless, she complied. So Gary's first move was to go to an ATM. And now Meredith was very smart. He obviously had to get her PIN number in order to access her money on her bank account. So once he got to this first ATM, he said, you know, like, what's your password? So she gave him a fake number. So he tried entering it tried again, tried again, and it didn't work. So then he went over to her, started threatening her, asking her, you know, why isn't it working? Are you lying? Blah, blah, blah. And then she came up with an idea and said, like, I don't know, it must just be the ATM. Like, that's my number, I promise. So he ended up believing her and going to another ATM. And then he went to another ATM and so on and so on. So instead of going to another ATM that night, he decided to park his car in a deserted little wooded area and they sort of camped out. Um, throughout the night, he did not let her out of her restraints. So then the next morning, they drove another 50 miles to a different ATM in Canton, Georgia, which is where I live. So this is why this case is like really interesting to me. Um, and she tried the same thing and it didn't work. So Gary Hinton decided to spill the entire story to police. So Gary told them that after kidnapping Meredith, he, you know, went, tried the ATMs a few times. Then they ended up staying at the campground. So they ended up staying there for about four days. And he said that he thought about letting her go a few times. He seriously thought about it. He said that he just knew that it would be between one of two options. Either he lets her go and gets caught or he kills her. So one night, about four days after she went missing, he went and told her that he was going to let her go because he genuinely thought he was like, okay, I'm going to let her go. He told her that and he said that he's going to go back to the van and get some pliers so that he can cut all the zip ties and stuff off. But instead of getting pliers, he got a tire, um, the cross thing for tires. And he ended up beating her to death with it. Um, then he ended up cutting off her head and covering her in bleach in order to just try and get away from you know, any DNA being left on her body, and then he dumped her in the forest in Atlanta. So in January of 2008, Gary Hilton was charged with the highest level, you know, that, of punishment that he could have been charged, so not the death penalty, but he got charged with life in prison for the murder of Meredith. After this, police, they just, they they thought that it wasn't complete. They still believed that he had something to do with Cheryl's death as well as the Bryant couple's death. So with a lot of hard work and dedication, they eventually were able to tie Gary Hilton to Cheryl's death. Cheryl's DNA had been found on two of Gary Hilton's sleeping bags as well as his shoelaces. And there was a few other things that tied to Cheryl's murder, but I just want to focus on Meredith's murder for this video in particular, but 
Inevitably, he was in fact charged for Cheryl's murder as well, and they also charged him with the death penalty. Um, so, as of right now, um, Gary Hilton is sitting in prison awaiting his execution date. Um, now, they, police still do believe that he has something to do with the Bryant couple's murder, but at this point, they, there's no use in trying to, you know, spending all the money and stuff because he is already sentenced the death penalty. Him being officially charged with their murder wouldn't necessarily cause any more punishment, if you know what I mean, but they pretty much wholeheartedly believe that he had something to do with that. And they also think he could have had plenty of other victims, not only the Bryant couple, Meredith and Cheryl, there could be plenty more victims that Gary Hilton murdered. People go missing out on hikes all the time and typically whenever you're hiking, you're hiking in an area that is super overgrown, there's just small trails, most of the hiking areas are just in, an, in like an area of woods, say mountain for instance, and there are just a ton of different trails so people go missing all the time it it could i mean imagine how easy it would be to have been murdered by garrett by gary hilton and police just never find you all right guys so i hope you all enjoyed this video it was super fun to film um i will say that my battery has died like a billion times throughout making this um so the sun's setting i'm gonna try and wrap this up really quick but um, let me know what you guys thought about this case down below, um, and definitely leave, like, suggestions for other cases that you guys would like me to cover, and just other videos in general. So if you like this video, give me a big thumbs up and subscribe. Bye, guys.